Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our working now through the entire deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to the Children of Adam section and the I Sing the Body Electric poem. We are now in passage number six. In some ways the other side of the yin-yang symbol to go back to our passage number five discussion just a few moments ago. Here, we're going to hear Walt Whitman as Democrat, as egalitarian. He's going to talk about rights. Hey, you guys, I have said to you before that I think a whole lot of Whitman and Leaves of Grass has to be understood in the broader perspective of his love and admiration for Jefferson and the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And of course, Today, rightfully so, we ask, how can a man who owns slaves have written a line such as that? That is a legitimate question. That was a question for Whitman. He did not run from controversy, although in this poem, section number six, in the 1855 edition, two times he used the word slave, and in the final edition that you're working with in your deathbed edition, it was edited out. We're going to talk more about that in the next section, number seven, but we'll at least raise the topic now, now my assumption is that you've been with us at LearnStrong.net, down the left-hand side, the Talks with Walt uh, playlist. My hope is that you've been with us from the very beginning and the inscriptions and then through starting from Pomnock. We're actually going to return to Section 7 here in a bit uh, to get ready for this study. All the way through our 52 sections of so a Song of Myself. And then finally, of course, we've already been giving lectures for children of, of Adam and I sing the body electric, and I hope that you've been following that so that you understand how our comments here are couched in those earlier comments. Now, I want to ask you if you can remember, we obviously played the game of starting from Pomenog Passage 7. We annotated all this. I just want you to be reminded of this as we pick up passage number uh, 6. I am the credulous man of qualities, races, uh, ages, races, I advance from the people in their own spirit. Here is what sings unrestricted faith. Omnis, omnis, that Latin for plural, right, for all. Omnis, omnis, let others ignore what they may. I make the poem of evil also. I commemorate that part also. I am myself just as much evil as good, and my nation is. And I say, there is in fact no evil. Or if there is, I say it's just as important to you, to the land, or to me as anything else. I too, following many and followed by many, inaugurate a religion, I descend into the arena. It may be I am destined to utter the loudest cries there, the winners pealing shouts. Who knows? They may rise from me yet and soar above everything. Each is not for its own sake. Everything's connected, right? I say the whole earth and the stars and the sky are for religion's sake. I say no man has ever been half devout enough. None has ever yet adorned or worshipped half enough. None has begun to think how divine he himself is and how certain the future is. I say that the real and permanent grandeur of these states must be the religion. Otherwise, there is just no real and permanent grandeur nor character, nor life, worthy the name without religion, nor land, nor man, or woman without religion. It's an amazing passage. And now we turn to passage 6. The male of, I sing the body electric. The male is not less the soul nor more. He too is in his place. He too is all qualities. He is action and power, the flesh of the known universe is in him. Scorn becomes him well, and appetite and defiance becomes him well. The wildest, largest passion, bliss that is utmost, sorrow that is utmost become him well. Pride is for him. The well-spread pride of man is calming and excellent to the soul. Knowledge becomes him. He likes it always. He brings everything to the test of himself. Whatever the survey, whatever the sea and the sail, he strikes soundings at last only here. Where else does he strike soundings except here? Let's pause. Let's take a look at the section. Notice we begin with, the male is not less the soul, nor more. That is to say, than female. He, too, is in his place. That is to say, this word perfect or harmony. It's one of the central ideas of all of leaves of grass, right? He, too, is, notice, just like the female, all qualities. He is action and power. Both of them, of course, are key terms in our study of leaves of grass. No question about it. Action and power, right? 
The flesh of the known universe is in him. It's a beautiful line, right? That idea that everything that has preceded you is there inside of you. Notice then he comes back to the line earlier in passage number 5. Be not ashamed, women, your privilege encloses the rest and is the exit of the rest. You're the gates of the body, you're the gates of the soul. Here he says, scorn becomes him well. This is Whitman's rewriting. This is that inauguration of that new religion that he was, that he was talking about in passage 7, starting from Pavanagh. Adam and Eve in the Genesis 3 account feel shame. That is the Milton rendition as well. And yet, here we're going to get scorn, we're going to get defiance as celebrated, right? We have said before that after our study of Jefferson's Declaration of Independence, if you want to define Americans, it's simply the mantra, don't tell me what to do. It is the Declaration of Independence. No, no, no. You don't tell me, I tell you. You don't tell me what to do. And it's here that Whitman understands what is foundational to being an American. So he begins with scorn. Scorn becomes him well. Appetite and defiance become him well, right? That is to say, don't tell me what to do. He says, the wildest, by the way, in 55, it wasn't wildest, it was fiercest. He edited the wildest. It's interesting. I'll let you figure out why. The wildest, largest passions. And then he uses the word bliss. Of course, we think about, that is to say, the pursuit of happiness from the Declaration of Independence. Bliss that is utmost, sorrow that is utmost. Go back to passage 7. In other words, Whitman's going to be the, 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 both the positive and the negative poet. Sorrow that is utmost become him. And then pride is for him. Now, we cannot read a line like this in 1855 without thinking about, of course, the way that Milton will have created the, the uh, great persona of Satan in Paradise Lost. Central to Satan's flaw is pride, and yet notice here it's pride is, for, uh, for Whitman, it's, it's going to be the central element, right? Pride is for him. The well-spread pride, he says it twice, of man. But then he, he says that pride is calming and excellent to the soul. Now this will be, I mean, th these lines are actually some of the most debated lines in Leaves of Grass when it's published in 55. What are you talking about? No, 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 it's satanic pride is horrific, it's terrible. So notice he's going to be playing around with the idea of what does it mean to have pride, right? Notice He'll continue with our big five. The first one you'll remember is epistemology. What can you know? No, knowledge becomes him. We're going to get to this thing about what you can know here in a little bit when he becomes very accusatory to, directly to the reader. Knowledge becomes him, right? In other words, we're always about wanting to know more. Go back to Daniel Bornstein's classic, The Discoverers, right? He likes it always. He brings everything to the test of himself, sounding very much like Protagoras, right? Man is the measure of all things. Or you'll remember those lines we've uh, talked about at LearnStrong.net from Alexander Pope's essay on man. Remember that one is from 1733-34. Presume not God to scan. This is in the second part of that. The proper study of mankind is man, right? And we've given a full lecture on that set of lines. Clearly, Whitman's in that vein. Whatever the survey, whatever the sea and the sail, remember Bobby Dick published just four years before 1855 and 1851. Whatever the survey, whatever the sea and the sail, he strikes soundings at last only here. And in parentheses, although not in parenthetics in 55, where does he strike soundings except here? This is going to be a very this-worldly poet in Whitman, and here is where humans live, and here is where all of the knowledge that can be gained. We think about Tennyson's Ulysses to follow knowledge like a sinking star beyond the utmost bounds of human thought is a clear mantra, and obviously the poem that Whitman loved, loved very much. And then the next part. The man's body is sacred, and the woman's body is sacred. Divine. This will sound very much like Emerson, but for many, many readers, this was a radical idea, as we've already said in earlier lectures. No matter who it is, it's sacred. Then the dash is the meanest one in the laborer's gang? Question mark. Now, that's not how he wrote the poem originally in 1855. It's far more challenging the way he wrote the poem in 55. This line ran like this in 55. No matter who it is, it is sacred. Is it a slave? That's what he wrote. 
Now he edited this, and I'll leave it to you and your own research as to why he would have maybe moved away from the direct wording of slave. We're going to see this again in passage number 7 when we meet the slave at auction in a, in a bit. But I just want to point it out to you. Is it one of the dull-faced immigrants just landed on the wharf? Now, demographic uh, scholars tell us that between 1815 and 1860, think about 55 is when Leaves of Grass is published, more than 5 million immigrants will enter the United States, mostly, of course, from Europe, yes? Notice that Whitman then will begin to challenge his reader to consider why it needs to be the case that America is a democracy for everybody. Each belongs here or anywhere, just as much as the well-off, just as much as you. Each has his or her place in the procession. Now this idea of the procession is a key, key image uh, for Whitman, what democracy is all that. It's like, a, it's like a big parade, or it's like a big dance, or it's like a big drama, or it's like a big poem. And he'll play around with different ones of those, of, of those ideas. But did you read the radical language here? For some, in especially 1855, 1860, for some, this is the most radical, far more than the sexual language, is this idea, read it again, each belongs here, or anywhere, just as much as the well-off, just as much as you. Each has his or her place in the procession. Now, note the genius of Whitman. In the previous passage, he's talking about the sexual relationships between men and women, and, of course, that language is really radical and sexual. But there's going to be male readers of that who will, who will enjoy that kind of language. But here, notice... The you is directed to the well-off, which is, of course, going to be a large part of the demographics of who will actually read Leaves of Grass, right? And then he continues, all is a procession. The universe is a procession with measured and perfect motion. This idea of harmony, I told you, he loves the word perfect. In Perfect Health and Passage 1, A Song of Myself, right? Then he finishes with four dramatic rhetorical questions. Do you know so much yourself that you call the meanest ignorant? By the way, in 55, that's not the line. The line went, do you know so much yourself that you call the slave or the dull face ignorant? Again, he edited out the strong language of the slave. We're going to get to that in passage 7. Look at the second question. Do you suppose you have a right to a good sight and he or she has no right to a sight? Whoa! Again, this sounding very much like the poet of the disenfranchised. Obviously, there will be a Marxist reading of this passage, no question. The last of these rhetorical questions. Do you think matter has cohered together from its diffuse float, and the soil is on the surface, and water runs and vegetation sprouts for you only, and not for him and her? Whoa! Now, I mean, think about this. The narrative of Frederick Douglass of the slave narrative, published in 1845, right? Ten years before the 55. It is a profound moment in American thought, in American literature, that these three questions will get asked in this way right here at the conclusion of passage six of I Sing the Body Electric. Can you understand why I said, although some people want to relegate I Sing the Body Electric to kind of like, Re it's redundant, I don't even know that we should be reading and studying this. I'm of a completely different opinion. I think that what Whitman is doing, especially in 55, when twice in the poem the word slave gets used, and then we're going to open passage 7 at a slave auction, I think Whitman is definitely wanting to challenge his readers to consider the fact that the world belongs to all humans, and that everyone has a right to be a part of the procession. And of course, that's our message at 2A. At 2B, well, the power of the rhetorical question here is absolute, no question. I told you, it's as if he somehow reaches out and he grabs the reader and says, hey, hey, come here, come here, come here. But notice here, it is accusatory. Again, each belongs here or anywhere just as much as the well-off, just as much as you, and then to jump down, do you know so much yourself that you call the meanest ignorant? 
Do you suppose you have a right to a good sight? And he or she has no right to a sight? Some have argued that these are, these are lines which must be read and must be challengingly read and studied in a time that we're living in as now. At 3A, well, we mentioned Protagoras, we mentioned Pope's uh, essay on man, but of course, Frederick Douglass is where we really want to make sure that we can't write. The narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, published 1 May of, of 1845. I've given full lectures on Frederick Douglass elsewhere at LearnStrong.net. Finally, at 3B, why do you think there is still such strong racism in America? Why can't all Americans embrace each other still, do you think? Again, this is a question for you. You get to own this poem. Do you think or do you hope that someday that will happen? That was certainly Whitman's hope. That was certainly the point in large measure of Leaves of Grass. We fought a horrific war over lines such as these very lines right here, which is quite compelling to consider. Now, some have argued that it's, of course, the very thing that we've said a few moments ago. The very writer of the Declaration of Independence himself owned slaves until the day he died. And it's there that explains the inequalities and the fact that we struggle to be able to see past, for example, color, uh, color of, of, of skin color or other kinds of challenges. Um, but Whitman's not going to run from this. And in fact, he's going to pick it up with passage number seven and passage number eight, which for some readers is the most radical stuff of all of Leaves of Grass. Come back, and we'll break our hearts and stand proud, all at the same time. Thank you.